a very warm welcome uh, on behalf of the hosting institution, the BMZ, um, but also us at the Berkhoff Foundation. Together with the BMZ, we have the pleasure of hosting the Global Learning Hub for Transitional Justice and Reconciliation, who puts on dialogues on transitional justice, and this is one of these dialogues. Um, Parliamentary State Secretary Niels Annen, um, we're really glad that you're here to open this event today. We'll be talking about gender transformative approaches to transitional justice. Without further ado, the word is yours. Well, thank you very much um, and a warm welcome to our ministry. Um, it is really a pleasure welcoming you today. And um, I, I have to start with an apology because I, unfortunately, I cannot stay with you. We just um, give a brief welcoming um, remark. It's been kind of a crazy day today. I don't know if you're following German politics a little bit, um, but uh, we had our new defense minister being sworn in today. And um, we also just came from our um, Bundestag's debate about uh, uh, the uh, genocide on the Yazidi population, which was officially recognized um, by a resolution. So um, I hope I'm also a member of parliament, so I hope you're for your understanding. But um, dear friends, distinguished guests, colleagues, um, in times like these characterized by the daily news of war, destruction, and violence, many people wonder how we can finally build peace. Peace that will last and that will enable sustainable development. In the German government, we are convinced that there are ways of leaving the vicious circle of violence behind. And even though you may be listening to many news right now you know, about weapons delivery, about the ongoing war in Ukraine, we believe that this is still a possibility. And especially here in our ministry with our partners, we believe we need to find to move that thinking forward. And in order to move forward on this together, and with determination, we adopted the interministerial guidelines on preventing crisis, resolving conflicts, building peace back in 2017, but they are still very much relevant. Transitional justice plays a key role for building peace in order to prevent further violence and to heal and to heal the wounds of conflict in society. There is a need to systemically and fully investigate and address the violence and give recognition to the victims, which is very important, compensate them and work on reconciliation. And I think all of you know that we have had landmark progress also in the judicial treating uh, with violence also in the last uh, years and even in the last weeks in Germany. Um, in such processes, it's important that nobody is forgotten, excluded or left behind, because all too often there are still blind spots in transitional justice processes. All too often, the specific experience, needs, and contribution of women and girls are neglected. Yet we know that the chances of a lasting peace are greater if peace negotiations and negotiated and built with all stakeholders. To that end, women have to participate, to be listened to, and to be empowered. This is evident from examples such as the Madres Buscadoras, the searching mothers in Colombia who are looking for their kidnapped relatives. In spite of violence and threats from the military and authorities, they fearlessly continued their efforts to have humane rights to have their human rights violations investigated and addressed, those contributing towards justice and reconciliation. You probably know that um, our minister, Svenja Schulz, visited Colombia, and we are very optimistic that we can continue this kind of work and line of work uh, also, or maybe especially with the new government. Um, Nepal, ladies and gentlemen, is another example. There are women, too, who have lost their husbands through violent conflict, 
have formed groups where they jointly engage in trauma healing in commemoration and try to make a new beginning. Some of these women have undergone training to become conflict advisors. Others were elected as town council members, for example, in the last elections. Women like them are important actors for peace and for social change. And the development ministry, where you are a guest today, we want to help them assert their rights and stand up against violence. However, in order to overcome violence on a lasting base, its structural causes have to be addressed as well. This includes discriminatory stereotypes and norms and unequal power distribution. And ladies and gentlemen, as part of our feminist development policy, we those want to expand our gender responsive and gender transformative approaches and our cooperation with civil society, including in particular with regard to transitional justice. This has also been laid down in the German government's relevant interministerial strategy dealing with the past and reconciliation. I believe that the Global Learning Hub for Transitional Justice and Reconciliation will help, hopefully, all actors, all German ministries involved to implement the strategy and gender transformative efforts. It will present lessons learned, further develop innovative approaches and purposes, uh, option, purpose, action, uh, purpose options for actions. And I am glad that today we have a chance, together with experts from UN Women, civil society, and various countries to exchange ideas on the challenges and the opportunities involved in gender transformative approaches in the field of traditional transitional justice. And I also want to add that we know from experience that it sometimes takes time. Sometimes it takes a lot of time. If I look at what is happening in Syria today, there is no prospect for a short-term approach, although we have been dealing with single perpetrators here in Germany, which sends an important message. So it's all the more important that the victims are assured that we are collecting evidence, that we are laying the basis for later judicial treatment. Um, and we saw that this is going to work and that it's a, a real opportunity. And it's not only important for the victims, it's also important for the perpetrators. To think the wars in Yugoslavia can teach a lesson there. So um, sometimes it's painful, it takes time and our patience, but it's important. And so um, I look forward to the outcomes um, of your exchange that um, Jochen Steinhebel will brief me about. And I thank you all very much um, that you are joining us here today with your expertise, your engagement, and I'm sure that uh, we will make that project a success. Thank you very much. The event today is hosted by a um, youngish uh, hub that really has set out to form a very vibrant intercontinental almost network that will um, bring international experience and sort of really experiential learning into contact with learning that has also happened here in Germany about sort of a long a journey of dealing with our own past or dealing with our own pasts. Um, when I prepared for this event today and looked at the headlines, I too was inspired by the news. Um, today saw as some of the headlines of the BBC website, the resignation of, I think, a gender transformative and feminist icon from uh, the office of Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ahern. Um, with, uh, I think, a resignation announcement that resonated with many of us and that, for me, sort of also carried something that has its core in a gender transformative or feminist approach, which said, I am human, you know, no matter what I do here, I am human. 
Um, the other newsworthy item that I thought I'd bring here today was a visit, a high-level visit, uh, of a UN delegation to talk to the Taliban about their ban on women working in NGOs in Afghanistan, something that is uh, at the opposite end of the spectrum from gender transformative. The noteworthy thing, though, is that the UN sent some of their most high-ranking women to have these conversations. And in the coverage, it said, when women enter the rooms in which these kinds of things are negotiated, we see greater movement, we see greater willingness to shift. And hence, contrary to the practice of some national governments, it's essential that we see sort of women also in these top positions. Gender transformation, hence, is everywhere, um, both sort of the feminist vision, I think, but also the anti-gender movement um, is palpable in the headlines every day, but probably also in the dealings of the ministry as much as the civil society organization and the adv advocacy organizations that are here today. Um, the Global Learning Hub for uh, transitional justice and reconciliation is made up of a partnership, a partnership of international and German organizations. You see the banner over there, and uh, I'm really delighted that two representatives of the organizations that are partner organizations in the hub are also on the panel today, Ivana Franovic from the Center for Nonviolent Action in Belgrade and uh, Christela uh, from Impunity Watch, um, Jochen Steinhilber, Director General um, for um, Displacement, Crisis Prevention and Civil Society at the BNZ, is of course also representing one of our political partners. Um, there are partners in South Africa, in uh, Asia, there are two important foundations here in Germany who all sort of bring their uh, power and their force together to really start a learning conversation. Um, in the um, hub, what we are organizing regularly, and this is the second in a series, are dialogues on transitional justice, where we're really trying to push the envelope. And tonight is no exception when we talk about gender transformative um, approaches to transitional justice. Our main purpose is really to change perspective, to put ourselves into each other's shoes and to take from that what really then will also um, enlighten our own practice and our own policy making. Um, we are quite aware that this event also sits in a journey at several of the German ministries where um, they are developing guidelines, guidelines on feminist foreign policy, but here in the house, guidelines on a feminist development policy, which is quite unique and a first in the international context. Um, and so the program that I have the pleasure of uh, leading you through tonight as representative of the Berka Foundation, which is also a uh, partner in this global learning hub, um, will uh, unfold as follows. Um, Asa Regner um, is going to, sort of deputy head of UN Women, is going to give a keynote. Um, and we will follow that because she also has to leave a little bit earlier with a Q&A of about 10 minutes, um, which will then be followed by a panel discussion when we're all sort of going to take a number of rounds to really look at what is going on uh, in our in our respective areas of work, what challenges and opportunities do we see? What recommendations would we want to put forward? Um, and uh, at the end of that program, in about an hour and forty five minutes, um, we would be delighted if as many of you as possible can also stay for a short uh, reception and uh, discuss uh, further. Now, I would need a quick sign from, that's a thumbs up, from the tech magicians uh, at the back of this room. Um, I think we have people also in the live stream following us, so they will also much appreciate that support. Um, I can't see you, Asa, but I'm 
confident that you're out there somewhere in the universe. <laughs> I am. I, I, can you hear I can me? Hear. Beautiful. Asa, very well. A very warm welcome up here on the screen. Thank you. Uh, allow me to briefly introduce you and pass on the warm regards from Parliamentary State Secretary Niels Annan, who uh, had opened this event but had to leave, uh, unfortunately, on urgent business. Um, Asa, Asa Regner, well, you were appointed um, Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and Deputy Executive Director of UN Women in March 2018. Um, prior to that, and as a long sort of as one station in a long list of uh, positions that were dedicated to really improving gender equality, you served as Minister for Children, the Elderly, and Gender Equality in Sweden. Um, you were at the forefront of implementing the Swedish gender equality policies, as well as really trying to shift towards prevention um, of violence against women and involving men and boys in gender equality work, something that is really essential. You have extensive experience in leadership positions in government, non-governmental organizations, and at the United Nations. And you've built and managed strong partnerships with a range of key stakeholders, including women's movements and civil society, both globally and in country contexts. Hence, you're supremely positioned to really um, open with a keynote that looks at internationally and at a global policy level, but with a vision to also influence country practice or in-country practice. Um, what are some of the steps and some of the recommendations that need to be taken in order to really reach gender transformative approaches to transitional justice? Last year at uh, the International Women's Day on 8th of March, um, you and women published a landmark report called Women's Meaningful Participation, Participation in Transitional Justice. And I understand that you'll also bring some of the key recommendations that went into that report. With that, I have spoken quite enough, and I'll hand over to you for your keynote. Thank you so much for having me, for the invitation, and for arranging this important event. Thank you to the co-organizers, co and most of all, thank you to State Secretary Annen and uh, the German government. Uh, here in New York and at the UN and UN Women, we really feel the feminist foreign policy uh, leadership that Germany provides, and it is obviously uh, very important um, for in, in relation to the times that that we live in. Uh, those of us who work in on these issues, I mean, or my days at least are full of hopefully um, meetings that lead to action in relation to Afghanistan, uh, Iran, uh, Ukraine, um, Ethiopia, uh, South Sudan, etc., where there are. Uh, either political crisis or armed conflict or a combination of these where women's rights and suffering uh, and um, very difficult situation is right at the center. So I am very grateful for, for this uh, initiative and uh, also grateful to BMZ and the Global Learning Hub uh, and just on, on transitional justice and uh, reconciliation for uh, our partnership and for inviting us. Um, so uh, we really see how gender inequality fuels conflicts and crisis. Uh, and as I said, it is also at the very heart of the violence and crisis in Afghanistan and Iran. And obviously this is about power structures where men feel they have the right to decide about women's lives and take away their rights uh, as it pleases them. Um, and often also in other kinds of uh, armed conflict and crisis, gender inequality and the first thing we often see is sexual and gender-based violence uh, and we see that, uh, of course, um, we've seen that during the, the uh, Russia invasion of Ukraine, 
as well as, as I said, in many other parts of the world, in Tigray and in, in Ethiopia. I was myself just now in South Sudan, went through the peace agreement with uh, government and women's organizations there. They have strong provisions for gender justice and transitional justice, but many, many times um, la what is lacking is structures and money and perhaps political will for implementation in many countries. We see this play out in conflict zones all over the world, Syria, Yemen, etc., Myanmar, Venezuela. The list is unfortunately long right now. So we think uh, from you and women, and we know we share this, this with you, that in light of all of this, we have to use all the tools at our disposal to address gender inequality as this root cause of conflict and crisis, and also make those power structures visible because we just have to dis we have to just uh, talk about them and try to dismantle them. And this includes the invaluable tool of transitional justice. And transitional justice processes take place at moments when states and societies are often grappling with their pasts. And if this introspection is not used as an occasion, an opportunity to consider and address gender inequality, these, as I said, power structures and gender-based violence, then that opportunity to change things um, in a very crucial way is missed. So how can transitional justice processes contribute to transforming gender norms and roles and, um, and, and, and uh, the legacy of violence of conflict and uh, author, uh, authoritarian regimes? So I suggest two related avenues of action. First, I think that transitional justice processes contribute to transformation by addressing, as I said, gender-based violence and the gendered impact of all human rights violations, in this case, against women and girls. And to do so, their, man their mandates must include gender-based violence. The work they undertake must be informed by a detailed gender analysis of the situation and of the context and the root causes of the violations, their patterns and their impacts. And this requires, of course, specialized expertise and, as I said, dedicated financial resources, uh, as well as a, as a commitment to follow international standards including a survivor-centered approach. This is very important. At the end of the day, a transitional justice process should aim to provide comprehensive redress to survivors of gender-based violence. And very importantly, a transitional justice process should include guarantees of non-repetition of this type of harm. A, tradition, a, a transitional justice process cannot, can uh, aim cannot a only aim to return a society and its citizens to the status quo, a situation of immense inequality and insecurity for women and girls. It must guarantee and have a way forward uh, that gender-based harms do not recur. Uh, and the truth about these violations therefore needs to be uncovered. Um, also, perpetrators have to be held to account, providing victims and survivors with reparations and recognition. And we need to take steps to address other forms of structural discrimination because the, the gender-based and sexual violence never just occurs as the first thing or in a vacuum. So it's important to take action to reform discriminatory law, to ensure access to education, economic uh, opportunities, livelihoods, and the full range of sexual and reproductive health and rights. It's all related. The second avenue of action I would propose and the focus of my remarks is, is that transitional ju justice processes contribute to transformation um, when they center women's meaningful participation at all stages and at all levels. And we just heard about that. So the inclusion of girls uh, and uh, women in line 
uh, with their involving capacities and LGBT people's organization are also essential to addressing gender inequalities and violence. And as you heard uh, a year ago on International Women's Day, UN Women and UNDP launched a report that focuses on women's meaningful participation in transitional uh, justice. And we chose this topic because we felt that women's participation was underexplored and needed to be further brought into focus to fully be understood and utilized. So I thought I'd uh, discuss a little bit what women's meaningful participation actually is, why it is uh, so important, and also how can we do more to promote it? There is a risk, I think, uh, that, I mean, it's, it's a very positive thing that these issues do gain more recognition, because they do. There is more political and international attention, but it, it's also important to, to move away from buzzwords that can mean kind of anything. And we do not want these important concepts to just be part of a jargon for us who are experts and work in this sector. Uh, so the Women's Meaningful Participation is mentioned, as you know, in several Security Council resolutions and often discussed in UN debates and uh, referenced in reports and very often in relation to women's participation in peace processes. Uh, but despite the fact that it's often and commonly used, uh, it, can, it doesn't really have a common definition. It's more a sense of you know it when you see it kind of, uh, um, well, concept. So in this publication, and you will see that if you, if you would like to read it, uh, we've tried to move beyond uh, this um, uh, or to clarify a little bit what, what, what it needs to entail. So we think that, first of all, women's meaningful participation requires that women in all their diversity are able to enter spaces where decisions are made. And also when they do, secondly, they have to be able to form coalitions, they have to be able to use their agency, have to be able to speak their mind, not just be in the background uh, or, or uh, be also in, in, in such minorities that uh, they are kind of hidden or forgotten, even if they are in, the, in these rooms. Also, women must be able to influence outcomes uh, and be in the, the strategic meetings where decisions are taken. And we have some examples uh, of what uh, women's meaningful participation in transitional justice can look like in, in, uh, in, in practice. So it can, of course, uh, firstly, take the form of women's political leadership. We know that transitional justice processes are very political. So political leadership and political will is very, very important. And this category obviously includes uh, women, uh, high level women on, as uh, heads of states and, and uh, governments, women in parliament, women ministers of justice or related uh, roles, uh, etc. Secondly, women's meaningful participation can take the shape of women's leadership inside justice institutions, like prosecutors, women's judge, judges, women members of truth commissions uh, or reparation bodies. Also technical experts like investigators, advisors, analysts, and even interpreters. Uh, a third example, uh, women's meaningful participation includes the participation of women's civil society organizations, women's peace builders, women's human rights defenders, those who advocate for justice, provide services to survivors and are watchdog over processes. And this can be locally, regionally, nationally and globally. And fourth, and I believe actually the most important category, is survivors of the violence, uh, the different kinds of violence, uh, to really support their participation in leadership. In any justice process, 
If women survivors, their rights, needs, priorities, perspectives are not guiding the way, we will just not have a successful legitimate outcome. Um, also, we were trying, trying to tackle a second question in the report um, to break down a little bit more why women's meaningful participation is so important. Well, firstly, obviously, because it is a basic human rights. Women have the right to participate in public life. And as you know, this is laid down in several uh, conventions and international agreements. Secondly, when women participate, we challenge discriminatory power structures. When we work with transitional justice, we must set good and healthy and sound examples. When women lead a transitional justice process, men are forced to acknowledge the rights and dignity of women, including the right to sit at the table, exert agency and influence outcomes. Thirdly, when women participate, communities and societies see and understand that women are agents of change and leaders. They're not only victims. Fourthly, uh, women's meaningful participation can lead to broader inclusion of other marginalized groups. When you put in place structures for more inclusive justice processes for women and girls, we have evidence and see that these same structures for inclusion bring in other groups, people with disabilities, people from minority ethnic and religious groups, for example, and a lot of information about both women and other um, uh, stakeholders. And fifth, women's meaningful participation can improve the effectiveness of transitional justice processes in general. When women are agents of change in a justice process, these processes are more likely to meet the needs of women and girls, but of societies in general, we know today. And it is important to recognize that women are not homogeneous and not all women represent women's interests or even feminist causes. But on the whole, we know that more inclusion leads to more effective processes. So I also want to soon conclu conclude, but also mention a third question from our report, uh, which is the what, meaning what can we, the international community, do further to promote women's meaningful participation? Because it is extremely needed at this point of time. Our policy briefs makes 12 recommendations. I won't go through the 12 but they are specifically directed to the United Nations. Um, but, uh, and I, I want to highlight a few of them. First of all, we must model women's participation in our work, own workforces. Uh, and I think this certainly goes for the, for the United Nations, but for all involved in these processes. Um, we cannot uh, only have uh, teams of male staffs or experts preaching to national counterparts that women's meaningful participation is important if we don't show it ourselves. Secondly, we should consider, support and implement a wide range of activities in relation to women, women's meaningful participation. And it's not, again, just about getting women into the room we have to be have a much more creative and long term uh, um, line of action than that. And we have to um, nurture these relationships and prepare these processes for a long time. We also know, as I said, that support to women's movements uh, is really important. And right now we have we see shrinking space for uh, human rights and women's rights organizations in many countries in the world where they are defunded, threatened, etc. So we really need to work on the co to build confidence with these groups. We also need to in integrate women's uh, meaningful participation into our monitor and evaluation frameworks. So these are all long-term commitments. Uh, we need uh, also to build uh, and maintain routine mechanisms for meaningfully consulting with and partnering with women's movements and survivors 
in tr transitional justice uh, contexts. It is especially important to be deliberate about this in relation to women with disabilities, indigenous women, young women, elderly women, those who are perhaps seen as marginalized or who feel marginalized. It's our role and responsibility to uh, see how we can engage with them. Uh, at last, but not least, we also think that we, we we don't think, we know that we have to allocate uh, much more of financial resources to support this work. Women's rights is, uh, is an area that's heavily yeah. under all our stock taking of progress in relation to international agreements and also peace agreements um, or where women are center show this. Women's rights are heavily underfunded and we just have to change that. So um, we are very happy to be here and very happy to work with the um, German uh, um, government and its feminist development policy and feminist foreign policy. And we see that the, the, the BMZ model for women's participation uh, by aiming for gender uh, parity at all levels of its workforce is really important. Uh, we also see that the, the development initiatives prioritize the, creating, the creation of an enabling environment. We have done that same exercise at the UN. That's really important if you really want to walk the talk about women, women's inclusion and uh, part of labor force in our own organization. And also we appreciate the consultation uh, part um, uh, with diverse uh, women's groups also girls, also LGBTIQ people, uh, as part of the creation of this policy, that's very valuable. And also we welcome that the policy guarantees robust financial support for the reasons I just mentioned. So thank you so much uh, for having me today and uh, thanks for your interest in going a bit further beyond the words and the concepts and into reality and action. I think that all of us who's, who see what is happening in the world right now and how women's rights are blatantly violated in many places in the world, we really both need each other, but most of all, we need to show solidarity and real action with women in those situations. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ozra Regner. I think that resonates strongly with all of us here in the room and uh, those who are listening outside, many of those who are in solidarity, in movements, in peace-building organizations and development cooperation across the globe. Um, I want to, because you can't stay till the fuller uh, Q&A later on, uh, open the floor for at least um, two or three questions. Um, following on the keynote. I know I have several, but I'll see if there are, is anybody from the room who would like to go first. Please just put your hand up if you have a quick question and uh, let us know who you are. I have uh, Dorothy Lepperhoff here in the front. I happen to know her. I don't <laughs> by no means know everybody here in the room. Yes, good evening, good day. Uh, thank you, Ms. Um, Regner, for your inspiring speech. My name is Dorothy. I work for the German Working Group on Peace and Development. It's a working group of governmental and non-governmental actors on peace building and development. Um, First of all, a comment. I think uh, through your speech, I, I wanted to um, emphasize again that peace building through transitional justice or processes or mechanisms is not a silent activity that we can contribute to the peace building sector, but it showed already that it needs a systemic uh, cooperation of different sectors and governance, rule of law, of health and education in order to be working towards a transformation of gender roles, gender norms, and towards gender equality. 
Still, um, also regarding your report, maybe you could also point out some challenges in transitional justice or for transitional justice in order to be um, gender transformative. Um, have you encountered spoilers? Who are spoilers and how can they be addressed? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Regner. Before you go on to answer, I'd see if there may be one or two more questions. So we collect them all. And uh, is there anybody else who already wants to break the ice? Otherwise, I'll add one of mine. Um, Ms. Regner, what you've outlined in the report and in your, uh, in your keynote was, is really both a systemic challenge and a systemic program. And whenever I find we're confronted with that, we also wonder sort of, okay, where are the priorities? Where should we start? So if you had to formulate um, a, a recommendation to sort of the UN member states at the one hand, where should they in 23, 24 really put their first decisive action amongst uh, the recommendations that you've given? Where would that be? Um, and maybe in particular also to push gender to mean both women and men. I think thank you, thank you so much. Ms. Ringer, the floor is yours again. Okay, thank you. I really appreciate those questions. Thank you so much. Very much. insightful. Uh, and obviously, I, as I said, I do agree that this, the, all of these, these uh, issues are very integrated. And I think that when traveling to these uh, um, difficult uh, situations uh, or, or places in the world where women's rights are violated right now, you really see that you can't just pick one issue or one process, as you said. You, re you have to understand where the women themselves come from and what you know, the whole range of experiences have been for them, and then take that seriously and 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 work with the whole process, as you said. Both um, otherwise, you won't build peace. Um, I am happy um, that the Peace Building Fund, uh, an important UN mechanism, as you know, uh, I, I really has this perspective, and we work uh, always closer together. Uh, uh, on these um, in, in, for example, South Sudan or Liberia, another country where I, I, that I just uh, visited. Um, I, um, I think the challenges, yes, I think the challenges, if I have to pick a few, there, there are many. Uh, but, and they, I, the, the challenges is really the value of women or rather the higher value of men, let's say. Uh, when we take stock both of the how uh, the um, UN and the UN Security Council resolution 1325 and following resolutions have been implemented as well as the whole Beijing agenda uh, after 25 years where people security is a big part when we try to really get deeper down into uh, why implementation has been so slow we do see that what is lacking is not always rhetorics. It's not even legislation and reform. Uh, legislation and reform is there. For example, legislation on uh, violence against women to a much larger extent than 20 years ago, which is great, for, of course. But what is lacking is, the, is, is really um, the political will to, at the end of the day, prioritize women's rights and situations with systems that can actually lead to implementation and with money from the budgets and to also give up something else for women's rights. That is lacking. And that uh, is something that member states can really, I, you know, think through and, and, and uh, see in their own work. And I mean by that um, all governments that have budgets, uh, but also those who are also developing partners and so on. But this is something we see uh, all over, uh, all over. And I also think that, um, uh, so a, a challenge is uh, to really, um, support the words with actions, because if you don't invest, you won't have action. Um, 
And the reason uh, these actions are underfunded or uh, the, the rhetoric that the rhetoric doesn't follow into reality is, as I see it, the fact that women's value is still lower and women's rights are not still at the heart of what is prioritized at the end of the day. Um, I, this sounds very gloomy now, so I want to also say that with many years in this business of both gender equality and also in, in relation to women, peace and security, I see a lot of steps forward too. I am very happy about the attention, uh, the uh, mechanisms, the resolutions, the fact that women can, can brief at the Security Council and they do so much more often, the fact that um, uh, peace negotiations, uh, although the progress is very slow, but at least the, no, the conscience or the awareness is there that women should be at the table. That is good, but it's just that there's such a gap between the rhetorics and reality. So I think that, uh, I, I guess I answered the question of what I think are our priorities and recommendations to member states. It is to step up the game uh, so that reality can actually change. It's to walk the talk. Uh, I already spoke extensively about funding, but it is also, uh, you know, how you how you show up in different settings. Do you come with a delegation from a country or a regional organization with 80% men and then tell uh, the warlords or, or uh, whoever it is in, in, uh, uh, and say, we think gender equality is super important. Look, we have two women here. So it, I think to me, it always comes, it comes to, back to walking the talk and being genuine and uh, to seeing this as, as a priority in terms of words, actions and funds. Thanks. Ms. Regnet, thank you very much. Thank you for your honesty, but also for charting a path forward. And with that, and I hope a very uh, warm round of applause. We'll say bye-bye to New York. Thank you for all you do, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you all very much for being here. Um, let me welcome you again. You might have noticed already I am uh, not a terribly formal person, so I hope I haven't ruffled any feathers by <laughs> mixing up uh, a sequence in which I would have, uh, would have introduced. I will go um, one more time to let you know who's sitting up here with me, and that I know that you'll forgive me. I'll start on my uh, very left, because I haven't, <laughs> I haven't actually uh, introduced Jeanette Bloomer yet when I... Uh, pointed out earlier who all from uh, the Hub Partners is here with us uh, today. But so for the next bit more than an hour, I have the pleasure with the four people here with me on the panel to go a little bit deeper and to also bring into view even more closely um, the different levels at which the challenges and the opportunities and the and the way ahead for gender transformative transitional justice and peace building and development cooperation are unfolding. Uh, to my very left is Jeanette Boehme. Jeanette, you are um, Advocacy and Human Rights Officer at Medica Mondiale, a well-known organization, a real champion of women's and girls' rights, especially of survivors of sexual and gender-based violence. Thank you very much for being here. Um, to my immediate left, uh, Christella, Christella Inyontima, thank you very much for coming all the way from Burundi. Um, Burundi, and uh, you work for Impunity Watch in Burundi. Um, I'll ask all of you to actually take us also to your workplaces and your settings when we go through the first round of questions so that you can maybe ground us a little bit in the work that you and your organization does. Um, but I know that you as a peace builder, as a program officer, um, really also work a lot around how do you need to change gender norms, norms of what it means to be a, a full woman, a full man, sort of norms of toxic masculinity, and I hope that we get to talk a little bit about that as well. 
Um, to my far right is uh, Ivana Svanovic from Belgrade. Um, Ivana and I have known each other for a long time, but haven't seen each other in a long time. Um, I can say that you're a peace builder of many decades. Um, I think a publicist, what we'd call an insider, reconciler, a trainer, and somebody with a team of, uh, or a collective, really, an organization at the Center for Nonviolent Action. We have tried to push forward for nonviolence as a principled approach uh, in a very patriarchal and not always necessarily nonviolent society. So I'm really curious to hear more from you about your experiences. And last, but by no means least, um, Jochen Steinheber, we're really delighted that you can be with us. Um, you are from the Ministry for um, Development, uh, for uh, Development Corporation, and uh, are the Director General for Displacement, Crisis Prevention, and Civil Society. So in terms of your immediate brief, um, not immediately dealing with transitional justice, but I think what we're representing here on the panel today is really all the different areas in which it shows up, which is influenced by what you do, but also which influences in turn. And because I did uh, call on you last, <laughs> in terms of the round of introductions, I'm going to start uh, with asking you the first questions. Um, Mr. Steinhofer, Germany has recently joined the ranks of a small but growing number of countries um, adopting a feminist foreign policy. And I said it's, I think, the first, one of the first countries that are also striving for a feminist development policy. Um, we've seen Sweden with a certain uh, backslip this year when the feminist foreign policy turned into a policy of gender equality. Um, Canada in 2017, France in 2019, Mexico, Spain, Luxembourg, and most recently Chile. Um, and here in this house, you're currently also working on guidelines for a feminist development policy. Um, can you tell us a bit more about what key features of such a feminist development policy are and what you're hoping to achieve with it? Yeah, thank you very much and uh, welcome to you all once again and um, I'm very glad to be here on the panel. Perhaps uh, two remarks um, before I start to speak on feminist development policy. I'm up today a bit more in a learning function because it's, uh, as I already talked about, going away from the buzzwords to make it concrete. And for me, it's very important today to hear from you on the panel, of course, principally, what is going on on the ground, what works, what does not work, what are the challenges. So this would be, for me, very interesting and also very interesting also for my work on our work in the BIM set on um, feminist development policy because we want to make it very concrete. I come to this later on. Um, second remark is um, that um, it's really an endeavor to talk today about transitional justice because transitional justice for me somehow is a tongue twister. <laughs> and uh, for that, perhaps, I don't know why, but uh, perhaps by, because I come from the uh, south of Germany, it's a bit of a problem with the tongue. So I use uh, TJ, not to say I'm very familiar with that, I'm not very familiar with that, but for me it's more easy to talk about TJ than about transitional justice. So, okay, having said that, uh, I start. It, uh, if I look at the audience, it's a bit also like um, carrying old to Athens to talk about why we need a feminist development policy, but just to mention two angles. One is, of course, be it education, be it health, be it uh, land, finance, it's very clearly the access for women in all these areas, in many, many countries, it's much more difficult than for men and boys. And in addition to that, of course, it's also very clear that the crisis, financial crisis, economic crisis, the pandemic, conflicts, climate change, and so on, have a much more severe negative impact on women. This is the one angle. And the other angle also, 
Asa already uh, recognized or talked about that is whether coming, uh, whether overcoming hunger, poverty, or concluding sustainable peace agreements or combating climate change or fostering also democracy. It's very clear that um, gender equality, it's not only a goal uh, for itself, but it's also an indispensable prerequisite for uh, fulfilling, implementing um, the other goals of the Agenda 2030, from my point of view. So the perhaps more interesting question is, what is actually new about a feminist development policy? And uh, there I would say the approach so far has mainly focused on promoting women, women and girls within the existing structures. This is not false, this is correct, but as we have seen, this is not enough. And from the standpoint and the point of view of my ministry and my minister, this is by far not enough. So what we are doing now and the goal, of course, of feminist uh, development policy or our feminist development policy is the equal social, political, and economic participation of all people. The second point is feminist development policy does not look at inequalities in isolation, but uh, recognizes that inequalities intersect and thus reinforce also mm -hmm. each other. And the main point is that our feminist development policy is focusing principally on the structural causes of uh, inequality, oppressive power structures, gender stereotypes, discriminatory social norms and laws, and so on. But the most important question, and as I said before, we want to make it concrete, is what does feminist development policy means in practice? How we bring it on the street? For so and. Also, Asa all already talked about resources, and this is for us also a principal and very important point. So our goal is by 2025 that 93% of all the measures of BMZ will make a direct or indirect contribution to gender equality. And the project that explicitly promote gender equality are to be doubled. So this is one point. The second point is we are not naive. This is also very clear. We are not naive, so feminist development policy does not meet with a positive response everywhere. But what we are doing, we are going into a close dialogue with our partners in the Global South, everywhere where it is possible. A third point uh, which is important, and to put it a bit more bluntly, is we are not looking, we are not only looking at our resources, our money, we are looking also at the money of the others, which means we will consistently introduce the feminist agenda in international forums and bodies, including U, UN, G7, G20, principally also an important multilateral development banks. A fourth point, which is very important, and I guess we will elaborate on that a bit further on, is for us that uh, feminist development policy is closely linked or closely involves um, gender organizations, feminist organizations from partner countries in the global south. And so we are f reflecting at the moment on that, that how we can develop approaches on how to reach these groups even better. A fifth point, which is important also from my point of view, is that we, in order to able to launch more target and more targeted manner, we will improve gender-specific data because this is really lacking, and this is a blind spot. So we try to bring this forward with uh, international organizations. And the last point is um, that um, also the beam sets have to continue, and we will look how we can improve our training and further education concepts in order to implement a feminist development agenda in a broader sense. So this was a quick sketch on what we are planning, 
but I'm happy to announce our um, feminist development strategy, which we will launch March 15, um, as a result, of course, of an intensive exchange between different stakeholders. And um, of course, you are all invited to this launch. Yeah, and I hope to see you there. We're looking forward to that. And I'm sure we might come back to some of the questions around challenges, uh, challenges in sort of mainstreaming such an approach sort of in a development cooperation portfolio in crisis prevention, uh, but also internally uh, in, the, in the second round. Um, with that, though, let me go to you, um, Jeanette. And uh, in this first round, we're really trying to hone in in each of the of the contexts that you're working on, the re relevance of gender transformative approaches to dealing with the past. Um, I'd like to ask you sort of sexual and gender based violence is such a um, uh, harrowing but, but key uh, element of many of the conflicts that transitional justice um, has to work through and has to address. Um, and the rights of survivors are a central element of, uh, of many transitional justice in dealing with the past processes. They were highlighted uh, rightly in the interministerial strategy. Um, how can these processes contribute to addressing structural roots of discrimination and inequality? And how can sort of they contribute to a gender transformation in addressing uh, sexually and gender-based violence? It's a big question, but can you maybe help us also with a few very concrete examples, uh, practical examples from your and uh, Medica Mondialis work and how, how do you address that? How does dealing with the past actually feature in it? And where does gender transformation then uh, come in as supported? Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm also very glad to have the opportunity to be here today. Um, while my organization has been supporting women and girls in armed conflict that have um, survived sexualized and other forms of gender-based violence in different regions of the world in armed conflict um, for 30 years now, and we always do this in cooperation um, with women's organizations and activists on the ground because they are the experts, they know the setting, and we try to cooperate and support um, them in actually providing um, direct services to survivors of uh, sexualized violence. And, um, well, we have a holistic approach. We provide um, so psychosocial services and income generating projects, legal advice, and, but we always, right from the beginning, we combined this work with advocacy activities because we just felt or we just saw that in reality, just providing direct services to survivors is just simply not enough, um, not for the well-being of the survivors and also not for um, actually having processes of dealing with the past. So it's always very important to at the political and social level to address the rights of survivors and uh, to promote those. And while, yeah, for us, like a, a gender transformative approach, of course, is key in this uh, respective um, for our work um, in order to, on the one hand, actually um, yeah, developing mechanisms and strategies to prevent violence against women and girls or gender-based violence, and also to provide um, appropriate services for survivors and to bring about change in um, yeah, the discrimination um, of them. And of course, it is just key to, in this context, really uh, to tackle the discriminatory uh, gender relations in patriarchal societies. And what is very key is when we talk about uh, sexualized and gender-based violence and armed conflict is that we take the broad picture. Because what we have seen in recent years um, is that we have a very strong focus on sexualized uh, violence and armed conflict as a weapon of war. And yes, sexualized violence is um, used as a mean of warfare, 
but it's a very narrow narrative or perspective. It's just not like the reality on the ground for when many women and girls, but also for men and boys who are affected by gender-based violence. So we really need to take into account the very different forms of uh, sexual, sexualized and gender-based violence and uh, to have an intersectional um, perspective on, on, on it in order also to um, prevent um, the multiple forms of discrimination. And just to, um, well, why this is also very important is because one of the results actually of this very narrow um, perspective on sexualized violence is that on the one hand, we see that in many conflicts, it's just simply political instrumentalized. The survivors are politically instrumentalized. And um, we, in recent years, for example, we had a lot of initiatives, especially from governments from the global north, um, short-term lighthouse initiatives, uh, maybe hosting a fancy international conference, but they really do not address the root causes of violence and they do not really bring about a transformative change. So we, but it is really key to have a long-term perspective when dealing with those issues. And I think one point that is very key is that, that we do not, um, but that we really address the continuum of violence. So the first step is even to already include um, strategies or to, to deal with the issue um, before crisis. So that to include it into crisis prevention, into peace building strategies. And while well, one very concrete measure, for example, is we still see that in crisis situation and also afterwards, it's still mostly women's organizations and activists providing services to survivors. And in many situations, they are already, well, they are underfunded. Um, they do not have the, um, the, well, the resources, and then in crisis situations, they are over overwhelmed and overstressed. And so a very important um, measure would be that already in times of peace to really strengthening and promoting uh, women's rights organizations and activists financially, but of, of course also politically. Um, and then I think, well, what we have seen, I mean, Mrs. Rigner already said, we have a lot of legislations already in place, where we have an international normative framework, but also we have, what well, we have seen in recent years, that there has been progress at national levels, so that we have a lot, or that we have some legacies um, to support survivors of sexualized violence, for example, in Bosnia and Kosovo, women's rights activists very successfully um, thought for a law to be adopted that would recognize survivors of sexualized violence as um, civilian victims of war. But what we see in practice is that there is a huge gap between, on the one hand, um, like direct services provided for survivors, and on the other hand, and like also legislations that are in place, but there is a gap between when it comes to implementation and especially with respect to sexualized and gender-based violence, um, the issue is not dealt with probably um, at, the social, uh, at the social level and also at the institutional level. And this is something we really need to um, come up with strategies um, to deal at this level um, with those issues. Um, to give you one example, for ex we had a study, we conducted a study on the long-term impact of sexualized violence in Bosnia. And even 25 years later, um, victims said, that, well, 90% of the victims asked, um, they said, well, that still my life is very much affected by this form of violence. And, it, and those were survivors who actually had access to direct services. And there were two key issues there. And the one is hand, on the one hand is that they are at a social level still so highly stigmatized that they are re-traumatized, they are excluded from social, economic, and political um, processes. And on the other hand, that, um, that state institutions are not well prepared mm -hmm. to actually provide services for them and that they even would discriminate and exclude uh, survivors if they would um, reach out and seek for help. 
So, okay. Thank, yeah. thank you. I'm going to stop you there. You've already planted lots of seed that, seeds, I think, that we're especially going to revisit in the recommendations round, sort of how do we really shape gender transformative approaches then. Let me move um, to you, Christella, and your work in Burundi. Um, Impunity Watch works on the grassroots level in Burundi. I yeah, excellent. Um, together with local partners in, very in a very practical way to address remnants or legacies of the civil war and that are still visible in today's norms or role expectations towards men and women. And in particular, I've learned you're working with women and men on acknowledging the persistence of negative or toxic images of masculinities that are linked with the violent past. Could you share with us why it is so relevant to focus on gender norms and roles, and in particular notions of toxic um, masculinity or to strengthen positive masculinity in dealing with the past work in Burundi? And again, could you also give us some concrete examples of how, how you do this work? I think they are um, yeah. all, they're on. That looks good. <laughs> uh, thank you. Perfect. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very I'm glad to be to be part of this. Um, I think the first thing maybe to mention is the context and the background of uh, the reason why having um, first of all transitional justice work in Burundi. Um, maybe for those who do not know much about Burundi, um, it's a very small country <laughs> situated in uh, East Africa, and we went through uh, more than 60 years of, um, 50 uh, years of cyclical violence, and which is um, actually um, um, linked to, to strong uh, gender dynamics. If we look at uh, what happened during those uh, different uh, crises, and so the first point to to, to point out uh, about the relevancy of having this work is the analysis that we can make uh, and see those dynamics that um, transitional justice uh, in its uh, target of having uh, transforming uh, the society we need to address those dynamics and also take into account the change of those dynamics after, uh, after, after these conflicts. Um, this means that, um, practically speaking, um, the, the, the norms and the cultural dimension of, um, of gender um, that developed, uh, that have developed uh, during the conflict do not end with uh, with conflicts, they are taken uh, through also the different mechanisms and different um, uh, things that are happen uh, during the post-conflict reconstruction. And so we need to take into account those particular aspects. And practically, how do we do it or why do we take into account those? Um, we, we first needed to understand for ourselves as practitioners and as an organization um, how these, uh, these uh, dynamics are constructed, uh, which are actually uh, culturally and socially um, built, and how um, war and violent conflict that we went through as a country uh, took from the sense of being a man, the sense of being a woman, the norms and attributes that are affected to uh, these di two different uh, categories, and how then this impact on uh, the, the post-conflict reconstruction, starting from the peace agreements, uh, the, the peace talks that happened um, uh, between 1996, uh, eight to, to 2000 where actually we had around the table only men deciding, discussing and deciding about uh, how this conflict uh, were going to be addressed. And so we understand that if women are not around the table, uh, there are certainly um, gaps that are going to be found in whatever decision uh, were taken among those, the, how uh, the impunity of um, 
of the, the, the crimes that were, uh, that were perpetrated uh, are, were going to be addressed. And so um, we need, needed to take into account this. But then practically, how can we uh, address those uh, is to, to strategically build uh, programs and projects which, uh, which, which try to respond and to integrate the cultural understanding of these aspects and having uh, practical conversations, pra practical um, tools that tap type into those aspects. Uh, for example, we had uh, we had had a project that went for five years, um, which were funded by the the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands, uh, which was supporting the women opportunities for women. And with that, we had, for example, one project. Uh, with with which we uh, accompanied a, a group of women who wanted to run for um, for 2020 elections, mm -hmm. and um, pre previously we were talking about uh, women political participation. And then we, when we when we were about to have these elections, one of our partners uh, asked us to support with um, with that particular project. And then so. We had uh, different trainings and different community dialogues in the community, but then for, for those particular trainings, we had to take the, a certain group of women, but then we understood that we can't um, do much without having also men as husbands and mm -hmm. partners to that process. And so we had to go through um, the practical aspect of their daily life in terms of uh, what they are, what they have to go through during a day, and how this can contribute or be an obstacle to their political participation. And so we needed also men to be included into that and to understand why these women need their support, but also need to take them to these different spheres where uh, conversation conversations are uh, t um, take place. And uh, we were. We were glad to see how this can work, mm -hmm. and with not really with much fund, but how these very small, like the very small uh, strategies, but which type into the real issues and which allow us to have uh, practical conversations, and so and also to 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 bring everyone uh, during uh, those those discussions. And so if that can be observed at that very local level, how can we then take it to um, different uh, levels and layers of decision-making processes? And also to see how, how to correct uh, this discrimination um, of women. Um, this means that uh, transitional justice needs to be understood also within a particular context where um, we need to link them with uh, the political uh, processes which happens uh, during a, a given time and also these transitional justice mechanisms, but also the different other uh, mechanisms that like DDR and other political processes, how are the outcomes of all of these contribute to this transformation that we are looking for. Thank you very much. And with that, I'll move over to you, um, Ivana. We're taking a little bit more space for this first round, I think justly so, because the, pro the, the settings are so diverse and we need to understand a little bit of where the work is and what it is trying to achieve. And we'll pick up the pace with uh, both sort of the challenges and uh, opportunities and the recommendations later on. But um, Ivana, from the, from the work that you've been doing and your organization over the past 20 plus years, um, I remember one segment that always stood out to me was the work that you did with war veterans. Um, peace building and sort of reconciliation dealing with the past TJ in a highly conservative and patri patriarchal society um, probably also is again, its very own setting that you need to take into account. Um, how do you work on gender 
transformative approaches in a society where sort of you have a very patriarchal setting, you have lots of hero narratives that might not per se be uh, non-violent, um, and that, that shapes sort of local and national political discourse. Um, can you give us also some concrete and practical examples of what your work looks like? Yeah, try again. Take that. I, I think now it's okay. Am I wrong? Thank you, yes. magicians. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Uh, I first uh, need to comment uh, that I'm really glad that there's quite some men in, inside this room and full honor <laughs> and respect. Uh, back home, I I expect not to have any or, or few of them who had to come because it's their job to sit there. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, I cannot fully uh, answer your question in, in these three or four minutes, uh, but I will try to give you some impression on uh, what we are doing. Um, and we do different things uh, on peace education, um, marking unmarked sites of suffering uh, in uh, uh, Bosnia mainly. Um, and uh, the main thing is bringing together people from uh, former Yugoslav countries in a dialogue. And in that process, we decided many years ago, like 20 something years ago, to start working with war veterans. Um, and it's funny, on the topic of gender, I'm going to talk about men <laughs> as a feminist. It is, for me, strange. Um, but wh uh, why we decided to work with uh, war veterans was that um, for us, it was a, quite of a challenge. As a peace activist, feminist, uh, conscientious objectors, whatever uh, the, the English proper term is, um, we needed uh, dialogue with people that are not like-minded. Like uh, and uh, we also, in this peace-building work, realized how strong it is when war veterans are bringing uh, uh, peace-building messages. It has much more influence on uh, the public than if I go out and call for peace. Uh, um, so, so we recognize them as, an, as important partners. But then uh, the other hard <laughs> part of it was uh, how to connect with them, how to really uh, start working together. And uh, we tried many, many strategies. At first, uh, we realized that uh, uh, we should not go to a meeting uh, in a mixed group with, as, as it was normal for us, like men and women, uh, but only men. <laughs> so we women pulled out. Then some time uh, after we realized that it's not about that, that it's the best that they are contacted by war veterans themselves. Just to be attracted, uh, just to be willing to listen to what, what we have to say and propose. Um, and um, now we are in the situation uh, to do things that we could not imagine 20 years ago. Uh, we are in a situation that we, we have quite a big group of war veterans from Croatia, Serbia, uh, and Bosnia-Herzegovina uh, fighting uh, against each other during the war and being in different armies uh, who go to commemorate the victims of war of all sides. Uh, and also uh, showing us places in, in their local uh, surrounding uh, where their armies uh, or comrades committed crimes. Uh, 
which is a big deal for, for my society. We still deny a lot. All of us were only victims. It was the others who were perpetrators and so on. So this thing with war veterans is quite um, quite a small revolution, I, I would say. Um, but then uh, one of the things, how we came to this point, at the beginning we were organizing uh, dialogue workshops for them to meet and get to know each other and, and build trust between themselves and towards us as peace builders also. And there uh, it was very important that uh, women facilitators and trainers are not present. So it's a men only uh, event. Why? I, I, as a feminist, was very angry about that. I pulled back uh, angry, uh, but I realized that it has sense. Because in this patriarchal surrounding, um, if a, a woman is present, or few women, which is worse, um, is uh, uh, men has to play their mainly role uh, that patriarchal society expect, is, expects from them. And if we are not there, they are free to cry and show their emotions and bond. It's strange, really, but, but it works. Uh, so I would say, yes, you need to learn how to build trust and spaces that people uh, develop this, um, well, trust. And then we can, can uh, work on peace building. Should they say some more? It's enough? Let's cut here. And I want give to give us all a challenge. And that is to um, run through two more sets of really hard questions really quickly. Um, Ivana, I'm going to stick with you, though. Um, we want to look at um, sort of maybe one or two real opportunities and real challenges that you would highlight for us here, all interested in how do we manage gender transformation by uh, doing small things in the beginning, but then working towards more and bigger change. So what opportunities or unlikely allies did you encounter? What challenges and resistance did you see? Um, and can you tell us sort of what you found most impactful in what you did? All of that in no more than two minutes. I'm going to not repeat the question, but it goes back to you then as well, Christella, and to you, Jeanette. We're just going to run through that. And then I'd like to ask you, um, Jochen Steinhilde, what you hear from that from a ministry's point of view, what you take away from that, Ivana? Okay. This is really hard, you said, yeah. Because there, there, there's, there are a few things I'm thinking about. Um, well, uh, for me, the main challenge was uh, really uh, learning to uh, talk to uh, war veterans. Uh, and learning to really understand them and not seeing as my enemies. Yeah. And I would say that um, it doesn't have direct in, uh, connection with gender, but at the end, all has <laughs> direct connection with gender because I, I uh, believe that you can you can uh, see how uh, peaceful one society is by the position of women in the society. Uh, so it's absolutely important that gender is a part of peace building uh, work. Um, and but, but why I, I'm saying this, I, I already forgot. Uh, Can you share yeah, with yeah. us also? Uh, what, what, what I saw as a big impact, I, I told you uh, the, that situation that we organized one event and uh, invited different groups that we work with. So war veterans, but also like feminists and some LGBT activists. And, and we had full room of, of these very different people. And when I say war veterans, it means 
um, let's say, usually rather nationalistic, um, conservative, um, um, not really understanding uh, human rights fully, um, and so on. Uh, but we came to the point that we all of us can sit in the same room and chat, which is for my society already a big step. So I would say it's it's a big uh, big impact uh, made. Yeah. Thank you. I'll stop. Thank you. I'm sure there's lots more to be said, and we'll go deeper after the event. But Christina, to you. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. There, there are a lot of challenges, uh, but also opportunities uh, to tackle uh, this issue. Um, from the oh, on the side of uh, challenges, um, one of the great um, challenges are the resistance of men uh, when we talk about um, the, the the need to have uh, women um, being part of the decision-making process, the conversations around dealing with the past. And one example that um, stick with me is, again, from that uh, gender justice project that we were having with um, women peace mediators, where um, they had to, 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 to lead the community dialogues on transitional justice and women political participation. And they were challenged by um, men from their own communities uh, asking them, uh, what legitimacy do you as women have uh, to talk about uh, these issues that are related to, to, to dealing with the past? And uh, it was a very great challenge for these women. Um, but after two, three, four uh, rounds of these community dialogues, um, they went from that being challenged to be uh, accepted as um, members of these communities and as people who were equally affected uh, by conflict, but with different uh, types of violence uh, comparing to their countrymates, um, male countrymates. Um, and this, uh, the, the other one is uh, the self-censorship of women, because um, they, with uh, everything related to self-doubt, um, uh, that comes with the way they were raised, culturally and socially, as people who are not around the discussion within their own families, from the early age to mm -hmm. um, to a certain age where you can be part of. Uh, things which happen in the community, but also at the, the country level. And practically speaking, um, in our cultural uh, way of living, um, the, the re, the, there are some discussion around, um, um, would I be able to speak about this in, uh, in English? Une discussion autour du feu dans un foyer. Um, mm -hmm. Where, um, where parents will talk about certain issues in a very um, artistic way. And, um, but women and girls would uh, be as observers of the discussion being held around in their own homes. And so um, sometimes during the different trainings that we have, um, one of the examples uh, I give is uh, do you find uh, easy for a woman who has been uh, raised being told that uh, this is not a space for her and uh, wait until um, she, gave, she gave my age, for example, and being asked to be uh, in front of people like you, for example, and have a discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and so this brings us to, uh, to speak about how we are raised but also, and then the, the, the need for uh, build this uh, agency to be part of this uh, discussion and to, 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 to build the self-confidence of young women and women uh, from the very 
uh, young age to uh, the time where they can be part of uh, the, 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 the the discussions uh, which go uh, around different issues. Um, and so the opportunities to be able to talk about all this is that um, taking um, transitional justice is really a great opportunity to not only address the consequences of violent conflict, but also to go into uh, questioning the this uh, structural violence that we find in our own societies and um, go beyond the uh, the legal frame, frameworks but and the institutional uh, frameworks that we uh, tend to focus on, but go into the structural, the cultural norms and attributes and question also the impact of um, violent uh, conflicts on this. And this brings also certain categories which are left uh, aside, for example, ex-combatants. Mm. who uh, are taken back to communities where uh, they found um, uh, cultural and social standards which are very different from where they've been uh, for a very long time. Mm. And this needs to, to, to deconstruct uh, a certain mindset mm. that cannot fit into a community led by um, civil uh, standards mm. way of living. Thank you. Allow me to stop you here, even though it pains me also a little bit, because I find what unfolds is the, yeah, the 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 big challenge and the in the 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 many ways in which in which you are opening dialogues, but also the long term endeavor that you're undertaking. Jeanette, um, can you give us also with a with a uh, attempt to be really short, maybe your. Um, biggest challenges, your biggest resistances that you encounter, but also your most impactful allies? Yeah, well, our most impactful allies are definitely the activists, women's rights activists we work with on the ground. And because, well, they are the ones that in reality or in practice actually take the risks and who are very closely working with the survivors in a context where sometimes like a big part of society has experienced trauma mm -hmm. then and, and they this is, includes them as well and mm -hmm. on a very daily basis they very closely um, support uh, survivors of, of trauma of sexualized mm -hmm. violence and especially and this is an enormous challenging um, work and many of them uh, have been doing this for 20 30 years no? so this is really I think for many of them, it's more than a job. It's really, it's the, the yeah, the, the sense of life. And so I think it is, um, it's very important also to, to kind of, to always be aware of the very different trauma dynamics, especially also within organizations. So what kind of impact has it also for um, activists, but also for organizations working in this kind of field. And I think, well, it is very important to have some sort of um, mindful organizational care um, approaches, but also to, because, uh, yeah, also to the question of, because there is so much under pressure um, on the ground and often, very often due to the systems in which they live and work, um, they also very often uh, co compete with each other because like of the patriarchal structures of society and, and politics, like for funding, but also like who uh, would be at the table and has the opportunity to talk. And I think it is also very important to really support and, cre and create spaces for solidarity so that those structures wouldn't damage the women's movement, but that we really would create um, spaces uh, yeah, for solidarity and for um, reflection and to kind of how to cope with the stress and um, yeah, doing self-care. And um, I would like, maybe I would like to add one more point. Uh, I think one very important actor, um, it's the youth. We should really not forget about the youth um, for very different reasons. Um, on the one hand, of course, they very often are uh, affected by violence themselves, maybe directly, but also very often indirectly. For example, um, they might be children born out of rape or like by transgenerational trauma because their mothers have, have been raped. And on the other hand, of course, 
they they are they are going to be the generation to shape their future. And I think they are very uh, very um, good examples of what really contribution or how important it is that uh, the youth would also participate in uh, processes of dealing with the past and. Um, for example, one of our partner organizations in Bosnia, it's an organization um, where survivors of or, or children born out of rape, they founded this organization. It's called a ch uh, um, Forgotten Children of the War. And they advocate at the community level, at the social, at the political level for the rights of the mothers, of their mothers and also for their own rights and recognition. And like those are really important initiatives. And also, well, one, one last issue, because I mentioned it uh, before, and I think this is really important also when we talk about dealing with the past. It's like really um, to have strategies to be able to work at the very different levels, starting at the very individual level, then in uh, working with families, with communities, with state institutions, and at the national political level. And I think if we don't manage to like, kind of get it together, then we will have a very different, uh, difficult time to overcome to, or to deal with trauma and also to overcome a discriminatory gender relations. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue with uh, asking impossible questions. Um, Jochen Steinhild, we're listening to these different examples on integrating a gender transformative approach uh, to dealing with the past peace building, into structural reforms, into grassroots work. Um, what do you take out of these examples um, that is pertinent to your work, both as a, as a ministry overall, but also your own work in crisis prevention and working with forced displacement and uh, strengthening civil society government bond. Um, yeah, let's thank take, you very I'll much. Let's take that. I was, I was going to pile on another one, but let's, <laughs> let's no, keep it. At th that. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Uh, that's a, there have been very rich examples, this is very clear, and I wouldn't dare to um, comment on all of these, but uh, let me make perhaps three or four points. On a more general level, I would say the examples you brought forward have been very instructive for me. It helps better to understand opportunities, of course, challenges, but also um, some more concrete points. I think no one should uh, expect quick wins. I think this is this is very clear. We can't we can't announce breakthroughs within days, months, years. You talked about some distances about um, 20, 25 years, 30 years. So it's a long distance race, and uh, I think uh, this is. This became very clear um, that um, there are constant struggles about transitional justice and that these constant struggles we have to bring forward. Tony Gramsci put it in the capitals of society. There are a lot of different struggles, but these are not um, the storm on the winter palais, how he took it, but it's always a constant struggles about years, 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 and the examples you brought forward made this very clear. A second point from my point of view was uh, very important that the examples showed that we need really a more multi-layered uh, long-term approach on the different levels. But one point you made very strongly from my point of view was it's, it's perhaps a kind of, uh, well, the notion localize it. This is really important, and you made it in your examples. And from my point of view, this was very clear that on at the local level, feminist approaches and um, TJ, transitional justice, try it again, are a kind of um, communicating tubes. This is where this became very clear. This was very clear in your in your examples. And what we see is that from my point of view, women's activism is a kind of a version of transitional justice from below. 
And uh, we need this transitional justice from below where women are able to articulate common experience, but also to translate, and this is what I mentioned before in my first intervention, to translate the talk about equality or the language about equality, about inclusion, into really concrete political processes. And this is, from my point of view, very important. And this supplements, I wouldn't say it's a counterpoint, but it's a supplement to this more sometimes abstract, overarching uh, narrative, which is produced by more international non-governmental organizations, researchers on, of course, the human rights context and so on and so forth. But we need really these grassroots struggles and to bring them in and to, from my point of view, and I mentioned it on our feminist development policy, also to reflect on how we can um, support these organizations or these local movements better than we can do this at the moment. Um, the third point from my point is, uh, was, uh, and uh, many the two examples have been very instructive on that, is that we have to explicitly engage also with the social environment of the women, and we have to support and target men as well as agents of change. And the last point for my, uh, I want to mention was um, Ivana's very instructive uh, um, example on war veterans, because it showed very clearly that we have to build up trust within societies, that we need alliances, and someone, and sometimes we need precisely unlike alliances. And it shows also that this is a, a very complicated, a very hard way to go to learn, first of all, to speak with, called it, former enemies, of course. Yeah? We have to learn that. And these are small steps, but sometimes these are really big steps for the whole society to build up this really um, hard work on building up trust within societies. And sometimes, and often, and mostly, it starts with small steps. And um, for that, I think we have to keep in mind not to neglect these small steps, it's because they are needed, and because they are needed in a long-term approach. And for this, thank you very much for these very instructive uh, examples. This is what I try to bring into my work, our work, but it resonates also very closely with our approach on a feminist development policy. Thank you. I want to juggle um, our plan around a little bit. Um, and rather than go into the last round of what recommendations would our panelists want us to take away from this, um, I'd like to open now for any questions, any reflections that, uh, that you have. And then we'll actually close with a round of recommendations as our joint and collective wrap up. Um, I'll try to sort of fix it in terms of genders, but I'm delighted in this setting to first give the floor to a man. <laughs> if you let us know who you are. Yeah, my name is Sven Stabroth. I'm coordinating the, or I'm heading the peace service program in Ukraine. And here comes also my questions. It's really nice to, uh, to, to really feel the experience. And uh, if my impression is right, we talked a lot about uh, post-conflict situations you're working still in or you are in. We in Ukraine are in an ongoing conflict. And our program currently tries to design to address also gender-based violence. And uh, this brings me to to ask you as experts for recommendations where we now in Ukraine can look and when we start with documentation of gender-based or conflict-related uh, related violence, what are maybe your lessons learned we, uh, we can already take into account now in this uh, uh, hot phase of conflict? Yeah, and uh, to, to be good, uh, good advisors to our partners in this process and also when it comes to a later point also to work with 
war veterans, I think, which, which in Ukraine is maybe also very special uh, because a lot of women are actually in the army. Thank you very much for this pertinent question. Uh, in being mindful of the time, again, I'd love to collect maybe a couple more questions, if there are any, or comments before I'll give the mics back to the um, to the panelists. And please. I have a question um, directly to Janet Böhme. Um, oh, my name is Celine Schneidewind, and I'm doing a master's at the Europa University Viadrina in mediation and conflict management, um, and just wrote a master's thesis on this in this realm of uh, work. And so my question is, you said that the focus on the weapon of war frame is a narrow perspective on sexualized violence, and that um, it can lead to instrumentalization of survivors or to using the phenomenon as a political strategy. And I was wondering, do you, or um, to what extent do you think that the differentiation between sexual violence and sexual violence and armed conflict makes sense at all um, if we put it in the larger frame of tackling gender inequality? Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a third one? Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Sylvia Savas. I'm a colleague of Doros, actually. Um, I work for the um, working group on peace and development, and I'm seconded by Ms. Area into this working group. Um, my question would go back to the um, to, to the fact that um, feminists, be it foreign policy or be it development policy, um, says we want to actually go uh, and deal with the underlying power structures on the one hand, and also to include many more groups, marginalized groups, and as I was talking about that in the beginning, uh, not just talking about men and women, so to say. So could you each draw the line again and make the, the connection to what extent these questions of power struggles, and you all in, alluded to that already, I am aware of that, um, and to what extent uh, your work with men and women also uh, facilitates bringing in marginalized, other marginalized groups. And again, Ivana, I, I'm aware of that, that you'd already been alluding to that, but I would be curious to learn a bit more from all of you about that. Thank you. Great. And then we'll take a fourth one, uh, but make that the last one, and then we'll allow the panel um, to respond to those, and then we'll slowly close. Hi, my name is Denise Hirao. I am from Brazil, and I'm a consultant. I'm part of a group, a consulting firm called Gender Associations International Consulting, based in Berlin. Um, so my question, which is a consulting firm specializing in women, peace, and security, by the way. So my, my question is about the role, the, the role of gender in as part of the causes of conflicts is quite well known. There is enough knowledge produced about that. To what extent, I would really would like to hear the panelists about to what extent transitional justice moments could provide an opportunity to significantly raise the profile of gender equality as a, as a means to prevent uh, conflict and, of course, to build peace. Thank you. Four easy questions that we're going to answer in one minute each. No. Um, who would like to go first of my panelists? I would Jeanette, start with the first start? Two question. Excellent. Um, well, of course, sexualized violence in armed conflict is also used as a strategic mean of warfare, but this is not the only cause or reason why this form of violence happens. And I think what is so important is that if we really want to come up on the one hand with um, 
with strategies to prevent uh, SGBV in armed conflict, we, we need to broaden uh, the picture. We need to look at the very different forms of violence and also like the different reasons and the different actors, because otherwise what would happen very often is that um, then international actors or whoever, they focus on one group of victims and of one group of uh, perpetrators, and that doesn't work, and also especially not if uh, we want uh, to provide proper um, support for survivors. So I think this is an important point, and also for practice, I think while different legal frameworks might apply, well, if you want to uh, prosecute the perpetrators. Um, I think with respect to the Ukraine, because also you mentioned the issue of documentation, um, I know this is a topic that has also been discussed a lot um, at the international level, and there have been also, um, I think, also important initiatives to thinking about how to document um, those cases to be able to afterwards maybe prosecute the perpetrators or to, um, yeah, uh, dealing with the past. But I think, like in, in crisis situations, very often or what we also heard from activists um, from the Ukraine is that, like, what is important is to, at, at the very beginning, to really fulfill the basic needs. So for survivors, it's more important to have a, uh, have a safe space, to have food, uh, maybe to get psychosocial support, to be kind of safe and, and stabilized. And um, if we initiate, initiate processes like documenting um, the crimes in such a um, traumatic, traumatic situation, it very easily may... Um, cause re-traumatization. So I think it is really important if you strategize um, for your programs to really um, have a need assessment and also really to be in touch with the women's organizations and activists who very closely work with survivors and support them and not just kind of donor-driven implement projects. I think this is very basic, yeah. Are you going to go next, Christina? Then we're just going to fill out the round. Yeah. Uh, for the, I would like to contribute to the response that she gave about the first um, question and uh, recommend that um, that the political and security analysis of what is happening should go beyond the sexual violence. Uh, which um, most of the time um, capture the attention of uh, different uh, responses that are bringing that that are being brought to to, to the political uh, solutions to the conflict, and um, question the the whole spectrum of uh, violence against women uh, beyond the sexual aspect. Uh, not that it's not important, not that it's not um, a terrible type of violence, but it's not only that. And the uh, second thing is um, not only to take men as um, doers of uh, wars, but also as victims. Um, uh, for example, um, there are men who are enrolled um, by force to do wars, uh, Sometimes or no, it's not always that it's their own choice, and that's a form of violence against men, which is um, often not uh, considered as as such, because of um, the structural, the cultural meaning of um, men is also is taken from the physical force and um, that they are brave and that they have the the responsibility to protect uh, a community, a country, and then uh, it, it's taken from that uh, um, particular aspect. But also uh, not only look at women as uh, peace mediators, peace um, um, contributions, contributors, but also to see what also women are bringing into what is happening as a conflict. Um, I'm saying this because from my own uh, context, there are women who were uh, combatants, but um, all, almost everything that is um, that has been done were only um, focusing on women as victims. But women are not only victims; they are also doers of of war. And then, uh, from the transitional justice perspective, how these programs and policies can contribute also to 
to respond to issues that um, uh, are around that particular aspect. And um, uh, lastly, I think um, it's, all, it's also uh, important uh, to see uh, the contribution of different, uh, different types of solutions which are linked or which can contribute to the, to the transformation that would, um, um, would look uh, into the transitional justice processes from the very beginning at the level of concept, conceptualization to the implementation processes. Yeah, well, let me start with this uh, question about Ukraine. Um, uh, I agree fully what Jeanette said, uh, uh, what is really important to do. But I also think about one very unpopular thing <laughs> for Ukrainians. And it is that it is uh, really important that the, as soon as possible, start work across the enemy lines. So contact with the enemy. And women are the best players for that. Well, that's my experience from the war in former Yugoslavia. It's easier for, for women to cross the lines, to talk, to, to bond, and to start to build strategies. Uh, and so I find it urgent. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what Sylvia asked about uh, marginalized groups, um, we are trying to involve marginalized groups as, as much as, as it is possible. And for all our trainings, uh, we, we have to have a look to have minorities from different spaces because even human rights activists and workers are not really aware of uh, of the position of uh, marginalized groups and, and minorities. Yeah, and, and it's for peace building crucial thing that you are aware how your, uh, your uh, uh, what's English word, made citizens uh, live. Uh, what kind of life uh, they have. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, perhaps uh, one quick remark on Ukraine. One of our main subjects uh, within our feminist development policy will be and is already uh, focused on um, migration and uh, displacement um, because in regard to the needs, the special needs of women and girls uh, in uh, displacement situations, um, but also to become more an agent of uh, also change. And of course, in Ukraine, we are working under very special conditions, and uh, and we are focusing very much on uh, also uh, psychological treatment. Um, but there is also a documentation process, but principally more on information. Mm -hmm. Um, within also from our organizations within the civil peace um, service, just to um, complete the other remarks on that. <clears throat> Another point uh, which was very interesting for me personally also this evening, and I already said it um, in my last intervention, that I think feminist development policy, and this goes a bit to the question from our colleague from Brazil, Feminist development policy and uh, transitional justice uh, are communicating um, tubes, pipes, from my point of view. Because uh, on the one hand, of course, um, feminist development policy and the principles of uh, feminist development policy, I mentioned the three R's, um, they can bring to transitional justice a more holistic approach. But on the other hand, not on the other, on the same hand, I would say, um, transitional justice also adds a specific lens to um, feminist development policy in conflict effect regions. Just to mention one example, uh, which we have not elaborated so much uh, this evening, but it's a very key um, area also for us is land. Uh, I already mentioned that uh, the access 
for um, women in many many countries to land is uh, it's it's very it's very difficult. So land reform processes, from my point of view, um, and which addresses equal access um, and the use of land, are an important contribution also to the transformation of, of gender roles. So, and um, since I'm the last one, um, before I hand over to you, thank you very much from my point of view and from my side. It was very, very interesting. Uh, in fact, uh, listening to you, your examples, your important work on the ground, and uh, to be sure we will implement this in our strategies, in our reflections on the feminist development policies, but of course also on our work with our partners on uh, transitional justice. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you all also for, for sticking with us. I will ask for your um, permission to go for another five minutes before we're actually going to have a drink and uh, something to eat. Because even though it's a real challenge, um, I tried to, um, to, to, to sort of ask Azar Regner about it. I think what gender transformative approaches to anything are are always attempts to shift a system. Um, and I want to invite all of the panelists just for one last recommendation. Um, one last recommendation that you would give um, on how to shape grassroots work that can enable gender transformative transitional justice, both you and, uh, and Ivana. Jeanette, I would like you to ask for one. I would like to ask you for one recommendation that you you take from your uh, long experience on advocate, sort of marrying advocacy and grassroots work. Um, you, you you started with some in the very beginning. If you had to formulate the one most important one, <laughs> what is it that you give? And I have a visioning question for you, um, Herr Steinhilber. Um, if you dare to look forward five years from now, after there has been a feminist development policy um, for five years, um, what is the most significant change that you will see in your ministry? You have the longest to think about it now. <laughs> we'll start with Christella. I'm gonna mix it all up because I need to. Energizes a little bit. Stella. Okay, but this is a very big challenge. Only one recommendation? Only one. Uh, it's very difficult to choose, but okay, let me let me let me um hope that um I will share my notes <laughs> so that my other recommendations uh can be shared. Um and so if I would have to choose, I would um recommend that the global programming uh, should be um, context specific and also uh, allow uh, some um, flexibility in terms of adaptive programming because we can't have um, a frame from for five, 10 years and expect that the context analysis that we make today will stay the same without being able to integrate some realities, some um, changes that we uh, come across on the ground. And uh, if we want transitional justice and gender transformative approach to really contribute to transformation, we need to be um, sensitive to flexible and adaptive programming. Thank you. Ivana. <laughs> uh, I would say uh, do not support governments uh, that um, look like uh, stabilizing or making stabilization in regions. It's false. That means uh, clearly do not support my government. Um, and uh, much more influence and uh, and uh, like positive work would be done in uh, more support to peace and feminist groups. Jeanette? I try to keep it short. Um, I think uh, to me, my experience, like the key word right now really is for me implementation. I think the 
uh, implementation of the strategy needs to be operationalized because we already have a lot of strategy papers and very often we lack the practical implementation and this has different dimensions. It's on the one hand really in the context of um, development cooperation with other countries but also really to make it sustainable within the structures of the um, BMZ so really to institutionalize the implementation of um, the strategy and I think one last important issue is, um, well, of course, we very much welcome that the BMZ um, plans to raise funds or uh, to increase funds for, um, yeah, for the implementation of the strategy and also in cooperation with women's rights organization. I think one big issue is that in practice or that a lot of uh, funding instruments that we have do not really work for uh, local NGOs and that we really need to work on um, on funding instruments that really meet the needs and requirements of um, women's activists and organizations. Thank you. Jochen Steinhelder. Yep, three points. Uh, first point already mentioned, and from you and from me, better instruments which we can reach uh, local women's movements. It's absolutely important. We reflect on that and uh, we see the necessity to, to bring that forward. Second point, uh, fulfilling our 93% uh, goal. And uh, third point, uh, pushing back together with our with uh, partner governments, international organizations, local movements, the anti-gender movement. Yeah, that's from my point of view. Thank you to all four of you, to all of you in the room. I think the beauty of the vision of the Global Learning Hub is that um, we may sit here in five years and look at the advances that we've made, both for transitional justice and reconciliation, for peace building, but also for gender transformative and feminist approaches to all of those. Um, for today, in absentia, I thank uh, Niels Annen for his uh, opening remarks, Asa Regner for her keynote, I thank all four of you. Um, I thank sort of the many hands, the great global uh, learning hub team at uh, at Berkhof, the partners that all have contributed to making this. If we've whet your appetite um, for a bit more, there's going to be a conference, a bigger conference, uh, looking at uh, transitional justice approaches, also hosted by the Hub in April this year here in Berlin, which we're very much looking forward to. Um, we say a big thank you to uh, the BMZ, uh, who through GIZ is funding this partnership and is helping us to also plan adaptively um, and, and keep on growing. Um, if you want to stay uh, informed, there is a website through the Global Learning Hub Endeavor, which is called transitionaljusticehub.org. Um, we'd be delighted if you check in. Um, we uh, hope, though, that now you join us for a glass of water or a glass of wine and for uh, any uh, exchange on the questions that haven't been asked yet or haven't been answered. Um, there's, uh, I think, a lot of challenges out there. We see, though, that there are also a lot of ideas, a lot of practice already there, and that there's a lot of need for solidarity and keep on exchanging on those. And for really role modeling that, big thank you and uh, good night. Mm -hmm.